Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spirit Plant Medicine. My name is Mark Cron, and it's a great privilege for me today uh, to be speaking with Deborah Meal of the Meal Foundation. And our topic today is about soul retrieval, a shamanic approach for permanent healing. Now, Deborah is a plant shaman, and she specializes in entheogenic medicines for soul deep, whole person healing. This includes soul loss and soul retrieval due to childhood and all of trauma and PTSD. As the president and founder of the Meal Foundation Spiritual Retreat Center, Deborah has been intensively trained in dialectical behavior therapy. We're going to find out what that is and is a clinical hypnotherapist. In her quest to bridge the gap between clinical and spiritual healing, she also received a doctorate of divinity. She's also a combo practitioner and has studied with shamans and traditional teachers from across the globe. In total, she has over 20 years of hands-on clinical and spiritual experience in trenches of trauma and addiction, and has witnessed firsthand the unprecedented and unparalleled ability of soul retrieval and other traditional shamanic practices to heal the heart and the soul of our most pressing personal and social issues. Welcome to the program, Deborah. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for having me on. Well, it's certainly a pleasure. And I know that uh, you were a vendor and an exhibitor at our conference when we finally got able to uh, convene as a community again last November at the conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just right. want to thank you for your support for being there and for the work that you do. And while we get into and dive into what we're going to talk about today, maybe you can tell our audience what, you know, about your story. What got you into this line of work? Did something happen? What was that transition for you that brings us here together today to have this conversation? Sure. So, you know, it started out that um, I was actually a paramedic for 10 years and um, I love that work. Um, I actually taught psychological emergencies and crisis intervention at the college level. And what happened was I was always very led spiritually. Uh, and what I eventually ended up doing was we went to Texas and we started a group home uh, that was a very Western clinical program uh, for bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. Now, at the same time, I was trained in dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a therapy that has an 87% success rate in treating people with mood disorders. And it has a Zen background. So it's, uh, it teaches mindfulness and it teaches emotional regulation and distress tolerance, all amazing skills. And at, the, and at about that same time, I also become a clinical hypnotherapist. What happened was, is that 10 years of that, and I was absolutely burned out because people lived with us for 90 days. Um, that's one of the reasons why the program was so successful is that we had hands-on access to people all the time and that were in our program. And so I, I just absolutely, it was a dark night of the soul for me. So I went to Costa Rica and I did 14 days of ayahuasca and um, which was extraordinarily intense. Um, I was able to then put together things that had happened to me in my childhood um, in regards to being able to, you know, step into that spiritual realm in a deeper way. I came out of that experience knowing exactly what I was going to do with the next half of my life. Um, I knew where we were going to be located. I mean, uh, it all, I mean, all of the pieces to the puzzle, I mean, absolutely fit together. So I got home. Um, I had studied indigenous medicine for years and years and years, along with the Western clinical background that I had. Um, and um, I literally, I threw out the program that we had. I looked at my husband and I said, uh, we're going to do weekend spiritual retreats. Um, and, um, he was a bit perplexed by that, uh, but he was, you know, he, he said, okay, whatever you think. And I just said, um, I know, um, that I'm not called to serve ayahuasca, but I'm absolutely called to serve psilocybin and, uh, we're going to start doing that. And so six years ago, 
um, in the state, in the big state of Texas, which we were still at at the time. We started very quietly um, serving ayahuasca or serving psilocybin to small groups. Um, and three years ago, we moved to Washington and I've done it full time ever since. So Beautiful. that's how I that's how I, I moved into this. Beautiful. So being in Texas and everything's bigger in Texas, were the mushrooms uh, bigger in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I couldn't uh, resist. No, I couldn't resist. They're not bigger, uh, but we're actually much quieter about it there. So yeah, um, well, a lot. It, uh, there was a lot uh, in regards to, you know, that transformation, lo leaving there. Um, actually, um, uh, a month ago, I actually got my church affiliate. Uh, we were already a nonprofit 501c3, but in for the, you know, for the sake of the United States, you actually need to be a church serving sacrament. And um, we do that in full ceremony. So uh, it was just one of those legal things that we needed to jump through. And so we did that. Well, it's certainly an interesting change in, you know, our society, you know, like say, oh. in, in some areas, you have to be, still be pretty quiet and things. I know yeah. here in Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada, you know, it's, they're, they're pretty open in terms yeah. of what, you know, they're not doing from a prosecution point of view or, or a legal point of view. Um, and to see how that's changing throughout the United States now as well with all the initiatives in, you know, Oregon, California, Colorado, just to name a few of the states. Um, how are you finding that, navigating that these days? Well, for us, um, again, uh, you know, we, we realize at this point we're kind of treading a fine line. Um, Seattle is actually legal. Um, where I'm at, though, um, not yet, uh, because not all of Washington has made it legal. But here is the thing I think that you would also agree with, is that all of the major hospitals have already researched this. I mean, we already know how effective plant medicine is. We already know how effective psilocybin is for PTSD. And quite frankly, we knew that 40 years ago. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of things that, you know, prevented people from actually getting the healing that we need. So, and I'm not opposed to Western medicine. I believe that Western medicine absolutely has a place. But I also know that after you've tried SSRIs and you've tried, try, you know, tricyclic antidepressants and you've tried all the stuff for anxiety and you've been on benzodiazepines until you're hooked and all of that, you know, we as a society need to come together to find a better way. And I really think plant medicine done correctly, um, again, uh, with the right intent and the right setting is absolutely transformational for people without a doubt. And I've seen that again and again and again. I completely agree with you. I've always been a believer, even before I got into this work, that nature is our best pharmacy. Absolutely. You know, pharmaceuticals come from nature anyways, when they find out what's working. Exactly. And then, yeah. you know, it was, I, I did an interview, one of the first interviews I did many years ago was with a woman by the name of Sherry Strong. And she was talking about sugar, right? How sugar is a drug. And she made yeah. it very, very, I love her, the way she described it because she said, anytime you take something green and make it white, it's a drug. Exactly. So, and it's a plant, whether it's a coca leaf or cannabis or fungi as a, as a mushroom, well, ayahuasca for that matter. You know, these are plants and we're not extracting things, right? right. We're using them, you know, you, in ayahuasca, for example, you know, we're combining a couple of things, but it's, it's plants. And there's something in my belief system that makes sense when you get all the different attributes of the plants that come together so you get the spirit of the plant and not just the highly active you know whatever they make an ain out of the sure. end whether it be ibogaine or cocaine or whatever it may be and then it gets right. refined and i agree with you where western medicine has its place for sure and i think that we can learn a lot from the past and that's why i think this work is so profound and knowing and hearing the stories of transformation where traditional pharmaceuticals haven't worked, you know, they're a short well, term. One of the things too, is that 
I mean, once you become aware that plants, that there's a consciousness, right? That you are, you are aligning yourself, your vibrational frequency to that particular consciousness and asking for that help to come to you. Again, it's one of those things that in ceremony then, I mean, that's part of what we do is you help people align themselves and understand that there's a consciousness. So the plant, the, you know, whether it's again, hape that you're using, or again, uh, iboga or ayahuasca, that there's an entity within that, a consciousness that within that, that actually wants to help you. And that's, again, where I think we've become disconnected as our society. Well, and, and I agree with, with that disconnection, which leads to, you know, when we talk about addiction and sure. the that community really has such a high rate of success in terms of not, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Not going back to the addiction or whatever that right. is. There's, there's a community uh, component that is really important that I think our society has lost. Um, and yes, there's community and there's things out there, but we're so separated now. And especially over the past few years that's happened, that separation that has got created where we don't necessarily always have the same uh, community support. And right. you know, I'd love to see even more of that. And I think it's starting to change and it, it's part of us and you doing the work that you're doing because it's when people can have that experience to me experience is the best teacher exactly you know, we can, we can yeah. read and listen all we want but yeah until you eat that mushroom you can't describe or pretend to think what that experience is or would be right. like i can't tell you what a rose smells like if you haven't smelled a rose you have to smell the rose right Right. Right. I am absolutely in agreement. <clears throat> so let me ask you this. You know, the topic of our, our conversation today is soul retrieval. When we talk about um, PTSD and uh, trauma and, and such, what does that really mean? And we talk about a shamanic approach and, you know, shamanic can be a trigger for some people. Some people are totally open to it. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your work and how you do that, what medicines you work with, and, you know, just kind of go down that road and we'll unpack sure. it as we go. So soul retrieval is a concept um, that is really broad based with all shamanic culture. So, and basically it is the concept that a piece of us um, is either hidden um, or is put off to the side subconsciously, however you want to look at that. For me, I think it's both. I think our subconscious is directly related to what we would call a parallel dimension. So what happens within shamanism is that we believe that spiritually everything happens within the ether and we draw that down to us. Um, what happens if we're a child uh, and we give up a piece of ourselves or if something terrible happens to us in war or in trauma, um, that a piece of ourselves separates off. So I talk to people that say to me things like, you know, it feels like I have this hole in my chest, that it ne I never feel full inside, that there seems like I, I can't get into the flow. I can't, I can't reach out to the God of my understanding or to my creator. And um, we begin to look at um, that piece that was separate from ourselves. So if you have to live your life or a piece of your life completely separate from yourself, it's very difficult to then get into that flow. So I, I say, for example, um, uh, as a small child, I went to a very conservative church. Um, and I got to, you know, hear from the pulpit, um, you know, what a terrible wretch I was and what a horrible sinner I was. And I was, you know, if I didn't, if I didn't, you know, do things just right, I was going to go to hell. That caused a separation for me from what we would consider to be a loving, divine creator in God. So I needed to come into terms with that, that I'd heard that over and over and over. It became a program for me. 
other instances of um, soul loss, uh, again, are you're in an abusive relationship and you give away a piece of yourself to satisfy or please someone else. Um, and obviously that can happen, man or woman, it doesn't matter. Um, men give away a piece of themselves to try to make wives happy. Wives give away a piece of themselves <laughs> to, to make um, their husbands happy. And sometimes they do that in an abusive relationship. If it happens often enough, then again, a piece of yourself um, moves into, again, either the subconscious part of your mind or the shamanic belief is it actually moves into Mother Earth because that's the only place that's safe for it. What happens in shamanism and what makes shamanism different is that um, shamanism means that you have a direct revelation. So I work with my spirit guides um, and um, uh, my uh, totem animals that come to me uh, in trance work. And I call those missing soul pieces back to that individual. I happen to do it in ceremony uh, when we do um, entheogens, specifically psilocybin. Uh, because that's where my gift lies. It can happen in a variety. You don't have to use entheogens to make that happen. It just happens easier. My belief is at least it happens easier when you're doing entheogens. That's the reason that people have miraculous transformation. It's not because I have personally done anything, but what I do do is I open a, what I'm going to call a portal or a vacuum or a toroidal field for that healing energy to come into that individual and for them to be able to find for themselves that missing piece. And many times they know when they gave it away or how they gave it away, or they feel directly connected to their creator in some way um, that they didn't experience before. That's what makes ceremony different than doing psilocybin either by yourself um, or in a clinical setting. It also makes a difference too, because not all psilocybin is the same. So for example, um, I'm very careful about, um, I either use golden teacher um, or the infamous penis envy in ceremony <laughs> because those two mushrooms provide so far that I found the deepest spiritual experience. And that's what people are looking for. If you do one of the others, um, lots of times you can have anxiety um, with the write up into your experience. And that again, then becomes, makes it very anxious for people that have PTSD. So I try very hard to make the, the gentleness again of the write up um, in regards to, you know, how people can to, to get to that ultimate experience um, as easy as possible. Questions? Well, no, I think it was beautifully said, and I could relate to to a, a lot of it just through my own experience. And mm -hmm. it's just when you said that, I because I get it. Growing up, I I was a pleaser to my parents. You know, I was the one. Right. To, not so. When you say when you give that up, I gave part of that up, and mm -hmm. it was part of my journey as I started doing my work, where I realized that that was a big part of it. So you know, and that's just one small facet of my life sure. what related to that came to mind and I, I love what you're sharing just about that spiritual experience and from you know the use of mushrooms and we talk here about that a lot the mystical experience the spiritual experience whatever that may be and I like to think of them as you know almost like a, a rocket fuel or a tool to awakening because you can sit in meditation you can get there but it takes a lot of time a lot of discipline and it's not always something that a westerner necessarily is going sure. to achieve I was blessed many years ago with an experience through meditation that was like it was like completely what they right. described but the you know to get back there in a meditation, <laughs> it's kind of fleeting almost. Um, right. But it opened things up. And I know that, you know, so many people that I talk to, these medicines help open that up. So we kind of get out of our own way and allow the mm -hmm. medicine to do the work. Right. Well, so and that picture behind you where it shows me in that integrative um, picture. Yep. So I tell people that you actually have the ability 
to see that honeycomb network in the air. So some people like to call that a hallucination. And what I say is that I don't think it's a hallucination. What I think is that we are all wired to be able to see that because we know that certain animals like bees and bumblebees and all of that can see that particular network, but we've been conditioned to not see it. Exactly. So I think there's been a lot that we've been conditioned to not see. Um, and we've also been conditioned a lot through childhood experiences and adulthood um, to not be in the flow of the universe, to not be able to co-create with, again, the divine of our understanding. So it's like we're stuck and we don't know how to get unstuck. Well, so, I don't want to go off on necessarily a tangent on that, but I believe that there's an over, you know, global desire for us not to see that because if sure. we're all free and we're all empowered and we all... <clears throat> are in touch with our own divinity in that way, we become very different people in terms of followership or what some and people isn't that sheep. wonderful? I mean, I tell people, oh I, my gosh, when yeah. this opens up to you and you can feel and experience that connectedness and that intensity of acceptance and love, you're right. Your life and, has absolutely changed. And when you speak of the sacred geometry that's in the image behind me on this side, mm -hmm. this side. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This side, right there. <laughs> there um, you go. You know, as you refer to animals and honeybees and things, let's just take a look at history. If we look through ancient archaeology mm -hmm. and we look at so many things that I have somewhat been repressed, we see the sacred geometry over the millennia through different cultures right. and time. So there's there's something there. And I know my first DMT experience was exactly, the, like I've done enough medicines in my day where you, know, you have hallucinations, you have experiences, but it was the most powerful one where all of a sudden it was just, and I remember my friend who was sitting with me, I was just like, wow, it was so beautiful. All the sacred geometry came in and it was all there. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life like that for any of my experiences sure. until then I popped into a whole nother world right but it was you yeah. know foundations and if we take a look at you know Tesla's work of 369 and how all these numbers and sacred mm -hmm. geometry that from the Fibonacci sequence as well you know like there's these building blocks of life that if we give them the opportunity and the attention and some focus can change our lives profoundly and and I think, and you you may be able to, you know, validate or or what have you, but it's you know these plant teachers change our DNA in such a way and open up things that our average plants don't necessarily do, right? Exactly. So when you think about soul retrieval as a fail safe, so what happens is is we become separated from our truest essence, the divinity, as you said, of who we are, the truest essence of what we were like as children, that innocence and that love and, and all of that that we had. So when we're separate from that, it then becomes difficult to step into, um, again, that flow of the universe and to be able to experience those things. So we know from indigenous cultures that again, being able to see um, the outline of the auric field of a leaf on a tree, that you don't have to have an entheogen for that if as a small child you were, that was pointed out to you. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting to me that, you know, it's like we're making this full circle around in regards to coming back into that nature coming back into that divinity of ourselves. And actually that's where wholeness is at, as far as I'm concerned, is the way I see it. When your mind, your body, and your spirit are directly linked up, that's when you step into that, um, you know, what I believe is an amazing life, right? I mean, yeah. that's why we're here. And, and you nailed that triad of mind, body, spirit. Yeah. You know, anytime we do the work, if you just work on the mind, great yep. 
yet not fully effective. You're not getting the trifecta. If you're just working on the body, you know, especially Western yoga, where it's like, did I strike the pose right? Did, you know, it's not about <laughs> yeah. that. It's yeah, about yeah. doing it and being present right. so that, you know, we're addressing our and working on spirit as well as our body. And so many people don't acknowledge spirit in that sense. And I think when you get that trifecta going, change can happen very, very quickly. And experience can happen very, very quickly because you're opening up everything. So of the medicines you work with, we've talked about psilocybin and I think there's no debate these days of how effective psilocybin is, but you also work with a number of different medicines of which uh, I have a high respect for um, from Combo, Sananga, Hape. Do you mm -hmm. find any particular medicine um, more effective to create that experience uh, outside of say psilocybin? So, what we do um, is that um, I do a three-day retreat um, for the most part, um, unless you've sat with medicine a lot um, and I can have a conversation with you about soul retrieval and explain that sitting in ceremony is so different because I've worked with people who have said, okay, well, I've done psilocybin for 25 years in my bedroom alone. Blah, and I say, well, I'm going to tell you that when you do it in ceremony, it's different um, and it's far, uh, I don't want to say stronger because it's not exactly the word, but it's more connective to do it in ceremony. And I can't, I, I can only give you, I can only surmise about why that is. But um, so we do a Friday night cacao ceremony. Cacao is an amazing heart opener. Um, it also produces a lot of oxytocin. So mm. there's a community kind of feel uh, when you do cacao together. Um, yeah, it's a heart and I believe for again, sure. Exactly. And I believe that that uh, is the first step. Um, we then do Cambo Saturday morning. Um, Cambo is, a, yeah, I tell people that it's a difficult medicine. Um, it's hard to purge because again, you're going to purge physically um, and you're going to purge emotionally lots of times. And if you don't purge physically, I almost guarantee you, you're going to purge emotionally. Cambo doesn't have any DMT in it in regards to having a hallucinogenic experience. It does cross the blood brain barrier instantly. Um, and so uh, when you purge, you are preparing your body and your mind and your spirit for what's going to be the next thing. Uh, and that's for us is psilocybin. So those two things I think make a difference. I tell people that hape, um, I don't use hape all the time, um, though I think it's incredibly beneficial. Some people need hape because it helps ground them. I think people that are extraordinarily sensitive to other people's energy, um, hape is a wonderful thing for that. Um, I also think that it also helps you focus. Um, I use hape in ceremony because there are certain hape blends that lend itself to be an invisible to dark forces. And that's the other thing we don't like to talk about is that um, when you're doing ceremony, um, you're opening a portal to hold the light in and you're holding the darkness out. And that work has been done again for thousands of years by shamans. The correct hape actually makes you invisible to those dark forces. Oh. So I use hape specifically for that. Um, again, people that are very sensitive to what I'm going to call negative energy, um, use hape for that same reason. And again, it's a plant ally. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about these in regards to plant consciousness. So when you start using hape, you use hape, again, holding it with the intention that you become connected to the frequency and the force of that particular plant. That's what you, you know, that's, that's where we're going. So without, you know, my, the presentation that I have in regards to soul retrieval, all of that is what I lead people up to being able to do psilocybin. So they understand lower world, where again, your totem animals are, your spirit guides are middle world, um, where again, you can run into dead people uh, and upper world, which is all about, you know, what you would call the angelic forces or um, angelic beings that come to you through the light. So once you understand that and you sit in ceremony, when those things appear to you, 
you're not then afraid, or at least let's put it, you're not as afraid lots of times, because sometimes we get into a ceremony and we see things that feel uncomfortable to us. Usually it's uncomfortable because we don't understand it. So when I tell people, um, you can look across at your fellow person that's there and they can skeletonize, it doesn't mean that they're going to be dead tomorrow. So move that out of your consciousness. So part of what I do in my retreats is I help people understand what they may be able to see. Um, so again, the experience, they can begin, I mean, looking at why that came to them in that, in that particular form. One thing I just wanted to add to that from just from my experience, because I, I think you, you certainly nailed it about, you know, that anxiety comes up or something comes up that they become resistant yeah and you know it's a simple quote i i love is what we resist persists and right. that's why it's so important to surrender to these medicines you know we're doing the work we're putting ourselves into that place and, and that experience that if we hang on to it, we're not you know you're not going to get near as much of it if you could just open up to it right, right. so I tell people that usually that happens because, again, our ego is there to protect us. It did a great job when we were a kid. But now as adults, once we have a certain amount of experiences under our belts, your ego, I tell people, has three legs. It's like a stool, power and control, security and survival, and esteem and affirmation. And the minute I come up to something that's foreign, that I don't understand, I go into protection mode. That's another reason why I go through what people can see is because I don't want them to go through protection mode. My people already have PTSD. They're already in fight or flight all the time. And it's like, so there's some fail safes, like, you know, you can raise your hand and go, I, you know, I've got a, I've got an issue. I mean, help me here. You never have so much medicine on board that you can't communicate um, unless you've taken a God dose. And I've sat with people that wanted to do that. How much would you um, consider a God dose? um, Anything over four grams. Okay. So what happens though, lots of times, at least with psilocybin with more than four or more um, is that you almost feel paralyzed Um, and that can feel overwhelming. Um, And then lots of times what happens is, is that you'll go back through your past lives. And I know that's a real controversial uh, topic for a lot of people, but um, I've talked to too many people. And I've also been on that end of the receiving too, where I've got to see um, past lives um, and you get to see your death again and again and again and again. And the reason the medicine takes you there is so that you're no longer afraid. That's the bottom line. But Initially, if you're not prepared for that and you don't understand that that can happen, it can feel really scary. So mm-hmm. education, education, education is what I say. Absolutely. And then how do you deal with integration after you know three days of, of work? Because it's yeah. such an important part of any personal growth, any kind of development and transformation is being into integrate and incorporate you know, this newfound, whether it be wisdom or experience or feeling into your life? What do you, what, um, yeah. so lots of times what happens is, is that um, people have this transformational experience and they do one of either two things, either they go with it um, or they try to resist it. So they get home and they talk to somebody mom, dad, the husband, you know, whatever the case may be. And um, there's some resistance because those people didn't sit in ceremony. So they don't know what you experienced. um, And that person comes back amazingly changed. So integration lots of times isn't just about them personally, but it's also about their family. And so what I tell people is that you can always call me Um, So I had a a gal that went through uh, and had an amazing experience connected to the God of her understanding that actually talked to her and a bunch of download come to her and information. And I said, oh, good. Um, And a month later, um, she had sold her house. uh, She got rid of her boyfriend. Wow. (laughs) She had done a bunch of things. Um, Sometimes that's how transformation then looks. 
and then the question is, is that do you have the skills then to move through that amazing amount of change? And a lot of people do. Um, I think lots of times we don't give people enough credit um, in regards to how they're going to integrate um, their new uh, soul pieces and who they are. Um, I've had a lot of, you know, I've had a certain amount of, you know, um, LGBTQ community come to me. You integrate that soul piece back and you go back home. Um, and lots of times there's major shifts that happen where you're in a job that you know um, is wrong for you, that, you know, you feel like, you know, your soul has been sucked out, you know, at the end of eight hours. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, and a lot of people make dramatic changes. Um, I, again, they usually call me 30 days later or three months later and say, this is how I changed and this is what happened for me. Um, I had one woman that um, uh, had been in the military, uh, was actually hooked on benzodiazepines, came to me, we did Cambo, and six months later, um, she became a Cambo practitioner. She said, this was, this was the thing that changed it for me. Um, I just think that integration um, always looks like understanding where that, where that person was at, um, where they are now. Um, and what kind of steps that they're going to take um, going forward uh, to integrate that newness. Mm, nice. And I think what, what do you feel about community? Because when you talk about families and going back to your family and friends and maybe sharing your experience, sometimes it's yeah. not so well received. And I know within our community, we see that a lot um, where people are just grateful that they can be around people, that they could have these conversations openly. Yeah you know, without kind of being judged or, you know, where they can actually talk about it, where yeah. it's difficult to talk about something that people just don't get because they think, you know, a mushroom is just drugs yeah. and it's all bad, right? Right. I think that, first of all, I think as more and more hospitals and institutions begin incorporating this, um, there's going to be a huge difference. Second mm -hmm. of all, I think that most of us are, um, when we have people in our lives that make huge changes, um, it's like coming out of a drug and alcohol treatment program. You know, are you a different person? How long is it going to last? I think a lot of people are kind of wait and see. Um, and you're right. The problem is, is that what happens is, is that uh, people go home and they're excited and they want to share it with somebody. And the first person they share it with goes, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, we'll, we'll see if you're really changed or not. Um, and again, uh, lots of times uh, it takes one or two ceremonies. Sometimes it just takes one. Sometimes it just takes that big God dose and people are done. Um, I, never, I never know exactly how that's going to work. Uh, but I just, I just know that 99% of the time people walk away uh, and they are transformed. Beautifully said. Now, I remember Jamie Wheel spoke back in 2019, and he did a uh, part of his his um, presentation was about who should do psychedelics, how often they should. And he had a nice chart and, and everything yeah, yeah. because they're not for everybody. Some people do it once and that's it. You know, some mm -hmm. people do it more and, and it. Because one of the things, trends that we see is, you know, ceremonies almost becoming, um, in some cases, you know, replacing the party scene or the, the weekend bar scene where we go sit in ceremony for the night versus go out and do maybe what we used to do. Sure. So, you know, it's, there's a respect and a reverence for the medicine to do the work. And it's not for everybody to necessarily do all the time. So I guess the question comes down to who is this medicine and this work for? Mm -hmm. You know, is it just for people with PTSD, depression, anxiety, uh, things of that nature? Or, you know, how does that apply to everyone? So it's kind of like your analogy about sugar earlier. You can be addicted to anything per se. 
you may not be able to be chemically or physically addicted, but you can certainly be psychologically addicted. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting thing about ceremony is it's different. You're not, you're not doing this and going to a rave. This isn't, yeah. I'm going to stand outside with my friends outside the porch and, you know, we're going to drop some mushrooms and drink a few beers and have a good time. Um, the work um, that again, uh, and that's what separates ceremony, I think, um, from what it is that you're referring to is that um, it's kind of like people ask me, well, how many day times can I do hape during the day? And I said, well, at some point, it's, it's, it's going to look crazy to do it like this. So, you know, if you're doing it, you know, 10, 15 times a day, you're, you're just trading cigarettes, you're trading for whatever to do this. So again, life skills, I think, come in. I think the other thing is, is that we as practitioners of this medicine, you know, if somebody came to me four or five times, I'd be saying, okay, now what is it that you're doing that requires this for you to now do psilocybin again? Mm -hmm. what, what, what are we missing? So, and, and I tell people that call me, psilocybin isn't right for everyone. Maybe Bufo is right for you instead. Maybe Iboga. If you're addicted to heroin, I can tell you, um, everything that I've read says Iboga is the way to go. Now, can you get off of heroin on, on psilocybin? Sure. Um, I absolutely think that's possible. But my understanding is that you might have to sit through several ceremonies for that, where Iboga is a virtually a one and done. So let me send you to someplace else. And I think that's the other thing about having integrity, again, as a practitioner, is that I don't have to sell you on doing psilocybin. Um, in fact, I shouldn't sell you on doing psilocybin. Mm -hmm. I should look at your situation and I should make a decision if I think this is right for you. Otherwise, I should send you to someone else. I should send you to somebody that does Bufo correctly. I should send you to somebody that does Iboga correctly. Or I should send you to, again, uh, somebody, you know, that does ayahuasca. Um, and I think that, you know, if somebody said to me, well, I've done psilocybin four or five times and I'm still hooked on whatever, I mean, X, Y, Z, whatever it is, um, I need to say, okay, uh, you know, tell me about your experience. Tell me about what you experienced in that setting. And then, oh, by the way, here, I think that you need to go and do something else. You know, mm -hmm. the essence of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So that's Absolutely. how I think we, we categorize that then. Well, and, you know, you mentioned integrity, and I think it's super important. I want to acknowledge you for that by, you know, just saying I'm not selling people, you know, referring right. to what it is. And what you said earlier, too, which is so important, and I think everybody needs to, to hear that is you're not doing the healing it's you're a conduit you're there as a sitter sure. but you're you know you're not egotistically the healer right? right and and i think that's a a big part of you know choosing the right facilitator um when you're starting to look into doing this work and of course doing you know, the right medicine for what it is you may want to achieve. So thank you for bringing that to our attention, because I think it's really important that, um, you know, people kind of, you know, do their research, do their homework to, exactly. to find out what's yeah. going on and not to just, because you hear about it and I'm sure you've seen where people are just so desperate to do this treatment. You know, they start lying about things or when they did that last or yeah. whatever it may be. Be, you know, if you watch the Dosed movie, um, did you see the the original uh, Dosed? I didn't. Uh, they followed a woman around Vancouver <clears throat> and uh, she had her own addiction. It's a great documentary. I recommend it. Everybody see it. Uh, they have a second one out now, too. <clears throat> and it started, you know, some filmmakers trying to help their friend and they because she had addiction issues and they started with psilocybin and it they ended up getting mm -hmm. to the. Uh, Ibogaine, and I, Ibogaine, working with Gabra Mate and a number of people. But it was interesting because yeah. how she had admitted that she lied about because she wanted to do it so much that, you know, she wasn't being honest. And it's important mm -hmm. to really have that transparency for the safety of these medicines sure. as well. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that psilocybin is gentler in regards to people that lie to you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, I mean, I've worked in the medical community uh, long enough to know that people lie all the time. And you're right, they're desperate. Um, and so, um, but certain medicines like ayahuasca, um, mm -hmm. if you lie about SSRIs, yeah, uh, you can die. Um, same with iboga. Um, you know, those are two uh, because they're MAOI inhibitors. Uh, you need to absolutely, um, and again, uh, you can go to a different facility and lie. Um, I, again, tell people uh, really, truly, I mean, I know how difficult it is to get off of SSRIs um, because I've helped people do that. Um, and, um, but the, the fallout from lying about that, um, again, uh, can be devastating. Mm -hmm. Not on to for mention just a, just a difficult experience, I mean, right? There we go. I, uh, we, uh, we have a thunderstorm approaching. And so my, the whole inside of my building just went dark because I have oh, overhead wow. clouds. <laughs> yeah. We've got some pretty crazy winds up where I am in the mountains right now. So it's a, uh, it's a beautiful day, yeah. but very windy. Um, so what else, you know, if there is anything you wanted people to know specifically about your work, about soul retrieval, about working with these medicines, what would you tell them that we haven't already necessarily covered? You know, I don't know that there's anything that I haven't covered other than to tell you that, um, you know, a lot of people are trying to reach ego death. I don't necessarily um, think that that's a good thing. Um, I think that um, if that happens, um, it happens in its own time that we don't force it. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing that I can tell you is that um, psilocybin, not all psilocybin is the same. So if you picked uh, mushrooms out of cow patties, I guarantee you that that's not the same um, as uh, golden teachers. Um, I really think that that's important for people to know. Uh, if you're doing this in a clinical setting, you're not going to get the same experience if you do it um, within ceremony. Um, you're absolutely not going to get the same experience. Um, again, if you're not doing it, you know, there's trip sitters, and I think that's great. Um, I think we need those. Um, but I also know that that's different than being, you know, being trained in shamanism and mm -hmm. what we do in regards to soul retrieval. Um, there's a difference in regards to somebody holding your hand and helping you through an experience versus somebody that's actually able to help you again, integrate again, those, that those missing soul pieces. Mm. And again, antigens have been used uh, for thousands of years. Um, and it was used as a medicine to help people um, in regards to their spiritual and their physical and emotional experiences. Well, and, and I think if we look through history, we could um, we could probably have a lengthy conversation about mm -hmm. the possibility of <laughs> you know ancient spiritual teachers and shamans using these medicines, even within you know some of our own lineages of religion. Let's say um, absolutely in terms of these sacraments. Now, one question that I do have because you talked about shamanism there again, <clears throat> and you know, typically, and this is, you know, how I grew up anyway, so I don't want to put it on everybody, but, you know, we would have this perception that shamanism were medicine men and indigenous people. And, and now we're seeing this um, change where so many, you know, let's, for lack of a better word, Caucasian folks uh, are now, you know, can, being shamans and, and working as shamans. Yeah. How do you see, do you, What's your experience in that as, as a Caucasian woman, um, as a shaman? Do you, you know, because there's, we hear a lot from the work we did, and we've changed things since I started in 2018 with Spirit Plant Medicine to really include as much Indigenous culture and teachings sure. as possible. So how are, how do you see that in your world and the practice that you, you're you working sure. with? So. First of all, I have to say that um, indigenous medicine and shamans that are indigenous that don't have any type of Western um, background or influence, um, I respect and honor all of that. My background, my people 
Indo-European, uh, definitely Celtic. Um, we can't, none of us can claim any kind of Druidism because again, uh, that was, you know, wiped off the face of the planet. But a lot of our people, uh, and by the way, um, part of my lineage is also Sami. Um, and so none of that made any sense to me because again, shamanism is about direct revelation. It's about having your totem animal step forward and tell you and or guide you in a particular situation. Now, that doesn't necessarily make you a shaman to be able to have a totem animal and a guide and do all of that. Um, but I'm considered a hollow bone and that I hold a toroidal field in regards to, um, again, allowing that healing energy to come through to people. Mm. Where did I get that knowledge and um, how did I come about that? Well, you know, it was kind of a slow drip, 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 um, but um, none of it I asked for um, until I got into ayahuasca. And I didn't technically ask for it in ayahuasca. What happened was, is that I actually went to uh, the place that I went to because I wanted to hear a, a speaker. It was a workshop. Ayahuasca wasn't even on my radar. Um, and um, I, I mean, I was absolutely driven to do it. The interesting thing is the night that my transformation happened, the night that I was called, there's usually 40 people that show up and mind you, this wasn't in the United States. I mean, this was overseas, 40 people usually show up. And the night that again, my transformation happened and I was called to do this work. Nobody showed up for that group except for me. Wow. Now, I didn't even realize that that was an initiation until I got back home and I started working with the Lakota medicine woman who mm -hmm. said, what did you see? How did you see it? What did you hear? What were you told? And only because she had done an entheogen years before and knew all of that was possible and then said, OK, you know, there's some there's some things within your education in regards to how all of this works that I need to help you with. Um, a remarkable woman. Uh, that, again, it was transformational for me. Doing ayahuasca was transformational, but finding her to help me put the pieces together so that because when I did it, nobody explained to me what I could see. And so when I looked over at the shaman and he had skeletonized into something or other else, uh, yeah, that was incredibly disturbing for me. You know, when I looked over at him again and saw him as as a um, as a black jaguar, yeah, really uncomfortable for me again, not understanding where I was being taken and what I was being shown. So my integration happened. Um, it was a much rougher experience <laughs> because there was nobody to call when I got home, like I said, um, except for this medicine woman that helped me along the way. So indigenous medicine and what we're called to do, you know, I can only tell you that um, um, we all come from tribal people, whether we are Indo-European or we are a direct descendant from the Cherokee lineage. We are all, I mean, all of us, I mean, we, we know that now scientifically, that we all are direct descendants. And so some of us, though, have been terribly misplaced. I mean, I can tell you. I mean, if I'd have had my choice, it wouldn't have been to be born in the United States. <laughs> I mean, I would have been in a different culture. But I also know that the God of my understanding placed me where I am to be able to learn what I learned to be able to do the work that I do today. And, and I honor that in all tribes, in all lineages, in all indigenous cultures. And again, with all my Native American friends. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. And, you know, it's the oneness of all people. Exactly. Right? And, you know, we're all indigenous to this planet to yeah. agree that we are, you know, <laughs> that that's for a topic for another show. But um, the, what we have to do is, you know, I spoke with uh, Belinda Aracho and she she called it like cultural appreciation and you know mm -hmm. we have to acknowledge the history 
it's not about agreeing with it. We weren't people who, you know, right. the atrocities that come not not just to the native North American indigenous people, but people all over the world and sure. these atrocities. And, you know, I think our work is to bring people together so that this doesn't happen again. And so that we Absolutely. can all see ourselves. We can't live in the past. We need to learn from it. Right. And exactly. so much that we didn't know. And the beauty of the internet and the technology we have is we have citizen journalists. Now we get, we're getting more truth. We're getting things that are coming up that, you know, we didn't know 40, 50, hundred, 200 years ago. And sure. I, I think the work here is for us to bring that all together so that we are one, we are humanity. There's, you know, it's like race. There's only one race. It's a human race. We have different cultures within our race and, and, and things of that nature, but we're just the race of the same people. And we go through the same things. We have the same needs, the same desires where when we really look at each person and you get that connection and realize that we're no different than the other person. You know, exactly. we all go through the same challenges and problems. And if we can have a space to let go and explore without that ego getting in the way, life becomes a very, very different thing. And I think well, and if we can offer community, I mean, I I mean, my people, you know, Irish background, potato famine, you know, brought up in absolute stark poverty. You know, can I then relate to, again, my other brothers and sisters that have gone through war and famine and all of that? I mean, you know, it took thousands of years for my people to, for my ancestors to live for me to get here, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, all of my ancestors, I mean, the women and the men that went through, you know, the poverty and the famine and the pestilence and the flu, um, all of that. Um, for my DNA and for, for me to actually step foot onto this planet. And it's the same for everybody else. Yeah. And I like that you brought that up because, you know, our, our ancestors are certainly part of who we are. There's no question exactly. we carry their DNA, their trauma, their challenges, the so many different things that, that we're not even conscious. So many people aren't consciously aware of. And as we do this work, we can clear that and clear a better path moving forward. So we're not bringing the same patterns that don't serve. Right. And, and I think that that's, I agree. Important. And I think psilocybin directly affects our DNA. Um, and I've, you know, I've been led through some of my own experiences to go back and fix some of the stuff uh, that my ancestors again, went through. Um, and have been shown that work too. And I tell people, you know what, um, the, the trauma and the lineage of whatever trauma it is, whether it's drugs or alcohol or sexual abuse or whatever the case may be, that can stop with you. You don't have to pass that down to the next generation. Absolutely. And that's just all part of doing the work. <clears throat> wow. Well, Deborah, it's been a really great conversation. I'm sure we could probably talk for hours on all these, you know, different multifaceted parts of the conversation, but I wanted to, you know, I like to keep it about an hour and I want to thank you for the work you do for taking the time out of your day to be here. And I want to invite people. If you're curious because you're in the Seattle area in the U S um, you can look Deborah up in the meal foundation. Is it .org? I'm sorry. I don't have it. In it the is. It is .org. Uh-huh. Right. And you can also meet her in person at the Spear Plant Medicine Conference uh, coming up in November this coming year. And uh, she's definitely out there. If there's anything you want to add, Deborah, please. Um, it's a great opportunity to let people know how to get a hold of you and um, whatever else that might be if they're curious about learning more. We, uh, we also have a Facebook presence. Uh, it's uh, facebook.com backspace meal foundation. We have all of our retreats um, listed there under events. Um, and so throughout the summer, it's about every other weekend all summer long. Uh, we offer a three day retreat. Um, and uh, if people mention that they saw this, um, we'll actually take $100 off uh, a retreat for them. Ooh, that's excellent. Thank you for that. So again, thank you so much. Keep doing the great work you're doing. If there's anything I can do to support what you're doing, let me know. Um, we're happy to, you know, 
let our community know because I think it's important that people know where they can get good, solid uh, support and practitioners in, in doing this work. So thank you for your integrity. Thank you for your experience and the heart opening you bring to many, many people. Thank you very much for that. And I encourage any of you, if you're looking to do some work, uh, look up Deborah at the Meal Foundation. Thanks so much, Mark, for Great. having me. Thanks, Deborah. Until next time, folks, we'll see you later. Take care.